This is Mark Van Doren, and this is capital of the state of Maryland. A small seaport in the 17th century, it has now grown into a town of many traditions. Colonial traditions, naval traditions, college traditions. I'd like to introduce you to St. John's, one of the oldest colleges in the United States. It is by choice a small college, limited to 300 students. It is small so that all the teachers can know each student. Small so that each student can find his own place in the college community. About a century ago, John Stuart Mill, the philosopher and economist, said that men are men before they are lawyers or physicians or manufacturers. And if you make them capable and sensible men, they will make themselves capable and sensible lawyers or physicians or manufacturers. This is the tradition of the liberal arts. At St. John's, this means learning to think, to analyze problems, make judgments, and express ideas. Every student follows the same course of study. Languages, mathematics, laboratory science, and music, which all center around seminar discussions of great books. Before he graduates, each student must write a thesis and defend it in a formal oral examination that bears on his whole education. He keeps preparing right up to the last moment. to answer questions that relate his thesis to the whole four years of study. Perhaps the best way to see the unity of the college program is by listening to parts of a student's oral examination and then going back to see where some of his ideas came from. Mr. Chairman. Mr. President. I present the candidate for the degree of Bachelor of Arts, William Herbert Barrett, to be examined on his thesis, Political Facts and Natural Law. Mr. Barrett, would you give us a brief summary of your thesis? My thesis is about the statement, might makes right. Many people accept this statement as a political fact. I don't. To show that they are wrong, I have to prove that might makes right is not a law of human nature. Now, there are many kinds of laws, and they're not all the same. There are civil laws and scientific laws, laws about the way things are, laws about the way things ought to be. Many kinds of laws. 
Differences between them had come up in all of his classes. But it was in the laboratory that Barrett first began to see the basic problem of law. 3.8. Ready? Roll it. 3.8. 3.8. Are you sure? 3.8. Oh, say, Mr. Wilburn. Yes? Look at the results we've been getting. It's not so bad. They look pretty bad to me. We're about one-tenth off. Well, that's pretty close to what other people are getting. Yes, but according to Galileo's law, we should get 3.9. Why can't we get that? Do you think Galileo did better? Why, sure, he must have. It's his law. Well, suppose you didn't even have a watch and had to measure time with a flow of water. Did Galileo do that? Yes. He had a large flat pan with water in it and a hole here and underneath a flask and the water was allowed to go into the flask. And he counted the drops of water? No, he might have done that. But as a matter of actual fact, he put the flask on a balance and calculated the time by the weight of the water. That doesn't seem very accurate, though. I suppose not. But even with this equipment, Galileo was able to see that the distances were pretty close as the squares of the times. Yes, but... Being close doesn't prove anything. No, but if, after some other experiments, we can fit this law of motion into a general theory of motion, will that help any? Yes, then a law is a law only because of other laws. Why not? Roll it. Questions and answers. Sometimes satisfactory, sometimes not. In the laboratory, the student tries to discover what the scientific understanding of nature is based on and how far it can go. In fact, although Barrett's thesis was on politics, he used what he had learned about nature in the laboratory to help him explain what he meant by natural law. You seem to be using nature in several different ways. In a way, I was. Is there any distinction you're trying to make? I was trying to distinguish between the nature we study in the laboratory and the nature poets talk about. I don't see any difference in a poet like Lucretius. I was thinking of Wordsworth, who couldn't understand why, why people wanted to live in cities. He thought they ought to get back to nature. Is this related to Rousseau's idea of the noble savage? Yes, that's what I was getting at. Rousseau's distinction between man in his natural state and man in society. Could you state clearly what that distinction is? It's the difference between doing something natural and something conventional. You know we say it's conventional to wear a necktie. But your thesis is about something more important than neckties. Yes, it is. It's about how people should govern themselves and if there is a naturally right way to do it. The meaning of the word nature is very important. The meaning of words. They are examined in every class, but particularly in making translations. In Greek class, for instance. Oh, logos. I wonder if we might discuss the meaning of that word logos for a moment. Of course, I realize it's very difficult to translate precisely, when I was working on my translation, there must have been at least 25 different meanings for the word, and I couldn't decide which one to use. But that happens in English all the time. Usually only one of them makes any real sense. But it isn't like that here now. Which is better, racial or reason? Word or relation or any one of them? Why do each, they of them each of them makes just as much sense. Why do there have to be so many meanings? A knife's a knife anywhere. A spoon's a spoon. I don't see why logos couldn't have a single meaning that would contain all the English meanings. You don't mean that one word, logos, would mean 25 different things, do you? Well, do you think you could say that the word logos is one word with one meaning, but that the 25 English words that are worrying us so much are expressing parts of that meaning? Well, let's talk about that tomorrow. 
through translating Greek, German, and French, every student comes to realize the importance of being able to say what you mean and mean what you say. The ability to analyze and understand problems is developed throughout the entire college course by the study of the works of great thinkers, word by word, phrase by phrase, thought by thought. But learning to understand means that the whole mind must be active, and Barrett had more to do at St. John's than study. There is saying on College Creek at the foot of the campus, and the students run their own club in the boathouse where they build and maintain the college sailboats. Playing fields and a well-equipped gymnasium are constantly in use. Sports are not compulsory at St. John's, but during the school year, teams are organized by class or dormitory to compete in intramural contests as each sport comes into season. Winter has its particular activities. Fencing teaches attack and defense. And as fencing develops the sense of physical timing, acting in plays develops the powers of poetry and rhetoric. What thou wilt. I am thy hero. Pick it up, pick it up, come on. And like my mander am I trusty still. And I like him to the big job kill. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the wall full, not your lips at all. Will meet me at Ninny's tomb straightway. Tide life, tide death, I go without delay. Thus have I worn my part discharged so, and being done, that wall away doth go. There is a Every Friday night, the whole college gathers in the great hall for a formal lecture, the only time the students are lectured at in St. John's. And these lectures bring into the college community the varying viewpoints of outstanding scholars, scientists, and public men. Later, the students and faculty get a chance to question and argue with the speaker. And these question periods are often so exciting that they continue for two or three hours. You remember Augustine says, I know, unless you ask me, and perhaps the philosopher should consider saying, yes, I can govern all right, but don't call on me to do it. Through constant informal conversations, after lectures, between classes, and in the student common rooms, the spirit of inquiry becomes a habit. And it was almost as much outside the classroom as in it that Barrett learned the art of intelligent conversation and acquired the skills to write and defend his thesis. It seems to me at this point that your thesis requires all the citizens of a democracy to have some understanding of natural law. Yes, that's my point. Does this understanding come naturally, or do you have to learn it? Well, I learned from Plato that learning itself is a natural thing. Could you say a little more about that, please? Well, I think that Plato means that we're not aware of just how much we know, and it's the task of the teacher to make us aware. As a matter of fact, that's what happened to me at St. John's. And do you think you know everything now? <laughs> well, no, of course not. But I found some things that I didn't know, and at least one thing that I do know. What is that? It's that one way we can learn is to get together and discuss our opinions. That is, if we don't mind giving them up when we're wrong. Can you show how that applies to the question about natural law? If you mean by show, demonstrate, I don't think I could. You mean as you would be able to demonstrate a mathematical problem? Yes. The trouble with political problems is that you can't treat them mathematically. Does that mean there's no way to learn anything about political problems? No, it doesn't mean that. You can learn to see more clearly what the alternatives are. In seminar, for instance, I came to see the importance of the disagreement between Aristotle and Machiavelli. 
It had taken Barrett a long time to learn to handle questions like these, to see how science and philosophy and mathematics influence each other and our daily lives. He had to distinguish meanings and analyze ideas. He had to be able to present an argument with a strict logic he had learned from mathematical discipline. But there had been moments of frustration and even of despair. Are the same and so on. Now, I think before we go over the proof, we should remind ourselves of where we stand. Figures A and B represent what? The Ptolemy's hypothesis. In each case, the Earth is the center of the universe. C is the Copernican system. The Sun is at the center, and the Earth revolves around it. It's just as if the Sun and the Earth had swapped places. That's right. And let me emphasize again that all this has nothing to do with observations. Nothing. It's a purely geometrical affair. Do you understand that? Well, what bothers me is I can see that the three hypotheses are mathematically equivalent, and that in the first two, the difference is only mathematical. But between Ptolemy and Copernicus, there's the difference of whether the Earth goes around the Sun or the Sun goes around the Earth. Now, how can that be just a matter of hypothesis? Well, why not? An hypothesis is just a guess about the way things are, and the only way we have to test it is to see whether it fits with the observation. But don't you see that both of them fit the observations? That doesn't settle a thing. Prove that the Earth goes around the Sun? Well, you see, this is a terribly important matter, and uh, we'll have to go into that in, in greatest detail. Right now, I think somebody ought to prove what we already have proved. Will you go up and come? Well, I think that this angle is supposed to be the same angle in the other diagram. This line... Well, let me help you. I'm sorry, I just don't understand. Don't worry. Don't worry, you will see it in a moment. Miss Carey, will you work? Questions and answers. Sometimes, students even question why they should try to find answers. Barrett went to the dean. Mr. Klein, I want to give you my key. Uh oh What do you want me to do with it? It's the key to my room. I won't be needing it anymore. I'm leaving school. Really? Perhaps you are. What makes you think that? Well, I just don't seem to be getting any place here. That's interesting. Sit down. There's no point in talking about it. Sit down anyway. Please sit down. You just said uh, you don't get anywhere. Where did you expect to get? Well, when I first came here, I thought there was something I could learn. But I... What kind of something? Uh, something like this key? Something we could teach you that would open all doors? Why not? Because there is no such key. Look, life isn't that simple. If you could have been here for about uh, two years, I'm really surprised that you believe there could be such a key. Well, I think I understand that. I've learned that. But if you want the truth of it... I certainly want the truth. Well, I'm just fed up with the whole thing. Now, uh, what do you mean, fed up? Well, all this talk about words and those abstract experiments, and you saw what happened in math this morning, what's it all got to do with me? I've got a life to live. Of course you have a life to live. Barrett had a life to live, and he couldn't see what training his mind had to do with living. There was no simple, convincing answer the dean could give. For Barrett, there seemed to be no connection between being able to understand Plato's arguments and doing one's job. Between the mathematics of Copernicus and finding one's place in a democracy. But the connection is there. To develop the mind means to exercise it in the broadest way. To train it in imagination, in mathematical accuracy, in powers of analysis and expression. The value of a broad, liberal education is enormous, but sometimes this is hard to explain. The dean could only try to prevent Barrett 
for making a hasty decision. Let's go to the coffee shop and have a cup of coffee. Come on. Well, maybe I can wait that long. And a little longer, perhaps. <laughs> Barrett agreed to wait and see if he could find for himself the answer to the question no dean or teacher could ever answer for him. All around him, the other students continued to question and argue, study and play. But for Barrett, there was something missing. He didn't see what St. John's could do for him. In class and out of class, and in the seminars, the conversations went on without him. But doesn't Machiavelli say in this passage that the prince must know how to act like a beast? Act like a beast? That sounds like a jungle. That's just what it's meant to sound like. He says here a prince must imitate the lion to defend himself from wolves and the fox to protect himself from traps. Machiavelli's point is that it isn't safe just to be one or the other. You've got to be both. If you're just a lion, you get caught in traps because you keep your word. But if he's both, then he's a monster. Monday night and Thursday night. Seminars. Free discussion by the students of a great book when they exchange and develop their own opinions in the conflict of ideas arising from their reading. The seminar is the core of a St. John's education. Here, all the skills learned in language, mathematics, and science are used in discussing Newton and Homer, Plato and Shakespeare, Mark Twain, Dante, Marx, and Adam Smith. All of the great books are read and discussed for their present-day significance. And it is here that the student's imagination can be awakened to the consequence of ideas. It seems to me that Machiavelli is moral. But he doesn't seem to care at all about what people ought to do. Of course not. He's a realist. He's only interested in the facts. What's the good of talking about imaginary utopias when the fact is that might makes right? That's not true. It's not a fact. A tyrant can beat down anybody, but that doesn't make him right. I agree with you, but how can you prove it? Well, but maybe Maddie's only looking at half the facts. People don't always have to act like a pack of wolves. They know what human rights are, and they can learn to respect them, can't they? It was this argument in seminar that showed Barrett how ideas could affect him and gave him the subject for his thesis. Barrett had found his place again in college life. <laughs> discovery in seminar, he went on to learn more and more about the place of education in society. Mr. Barrett, that seems to have developed your thesis very nicely. But I still have one question to ask you. What kind of a safeguard does a democracy have against tyranny? Well, it seems that education is the only safeguard. But uh, isn't education itself subject to tyranny? Wouldn't it be possible to set up an educational system that would help to enslave people? Yes, it would. I was thinking of an education that would teach you to think yourself. Then education can be bad. Yes, when it pretends to teach you what you ought to think. I don't mean that a good education is easy, but it's the only safeguard that a democracy has, because it must teach its people to think clearly and act impartially. Our time seems to be about up. Thank you very much, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Men 
are men before they are lawyers or physicians or manufacturers. And if you make them capable and sensible men, they will make themselves capable and sensible lawyers or physicians or manufacturers. Making them capable men is what St. John's sets out to do.